Well, maybe now we can talk a bit more about your work um, on the future of work in transportation. So you've done a lot of research on it and how it's reshaping transportation. So from your expect, um, perspective, how would you frame the key research question for the future of work and what drew you to explore this topic in the first place? Yeah, so I mean, I was drawn to it, I guess, because I kind of watched it happen. So I started my PhD in September of 2019. So like just about five months in, um, we saw the first COVID lockdowns in the US. I remember sitting at a restaurant in Kendall Square um, and kind of getting the email from MIT that courses, classes were going to be closed the next day. And uh, little did I realize it was going to, you know, last, uh, I think, three full semesters or two and a half semesters um, of, of fully remote classes and, you know, all the other stuff that happened around the world in that time. Um, but it was really interesting. I mean, once we, we noticed right away that, you know, a lot of people were able to work from home. Um, and keep doing their jobs. And it completely changed how people moved around cities. Um, and, you know, a little bit more from like a pragmatic perspective as a PhD student, it was also something that was really new. So nobody else had done research on the topic. I, I mean, that's not to say there hasn't been great research on like teleworking and remote working going back many decades, but it just never existed at that kind of scale before. And it wasn't like a whole of society, you know, it was like two or 3% of people were remote working maybe one or two days a week. And now all of a sudden, like at least in, in May of 2022, I think it was like 60 something percent of all American, of all worked hours in the US were happening remotely. Um, so it was exciting because I didn't have any, you know, I, I didn't have to worry about like some pa finding some past literature that had completely um, already explored that research avenue. Um, I was able to kind of move forward and be one of the first people to really look into this in detail and what it means when there's like this amount of people actually doing remote work um, and how that impacts you know transportation systems. Makes a lot of sense, and it must be quite exciting to be on the cutting edge of something that's also happening to you in the middle of your research, right? Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned, you know, kind of what are the key research questions. Um, and so that's, you know, ultimately what I tried to address in my dissertation. But at, I think really at the time we were trying to understand, like, how does this change the demand for transportation? Um, not just like in terms of overall volume, but also like the spatial distribution of demand, temporal distribution of demand, you know, what time are people going to commute um, if they're not, or, you know, what time are they starting work if they're not commuting? Um, where are they moving to um, and how is that affecting their travel demand? And then I think perhaps the bigger question, and this was like kind of the second half of my dissertation was like, well, then what should people do if this um, entire kind of pattern of transportation has completely changed, um, you know, effectively overnight? And so how can transport operators adapt, but also, you know, policymakers, um, you know, service providers, the kind of like, um, you know, office uh, real estate companies, like all of these things were in so much flux at the time um, and still are to a certain extent. I mean, I really don't think we've reached an equilibrium yet, um, but it was trying to give some early advice to all of those different groups of stakeholders who are affected by this, um, you know, huge upheaval in where people were working and uh, help them adapt and hopefully deliver better services that su suited the kind of emerging needs of the um, Commuters. Well, you talked about the spatial um, change that that uh, went uh, under, like occurred because of COVID nineteen. And so, speaking of which, we you also studied the idea of this third place. So, for those who aren't familiar, what is a third place, and how do you commute to third places differ from traditional workplace commutes? Yeah, thanks. Um, so we we kind of adopted this terminology. I mean, a third place had been something that people had been talking about for some time. And usually it was like a non non work. So that maybe being, I guess, non home, home being the first place and then non work, if you want to call work the sort of second place that you visit on a kind of typical weekly schedule, um, then the third place was something else entirely. And usually they were kind of oriented towards socializing. So it could be like a restaurant or a community center or like a bowling alley. Um, somewhere where you went that wasn't your home and wasn't your work to interact with your friends. Um, but we kind of borrowed that terminology um, to, to, to kind of apply it to where people actually started to work during the um, kind of aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, because a lot of those places were turning into workplaces. So we saw like restaurants in Cambridge that were 
giving sort of day passes to remote workers to come and you, you would get a certain amount of drinks and, you know, a free lunch if you paid this amount and you could work at your table in the restaurant uh, throughout the day. Um, we also saw companies like WeWork um, that were, you know, already providing some kind of flexible office space. Um, they started doing an all access pass. So you didn't even necessarily have to like rent one desk at one WeWork, but you could pay a little bit more and then you could go wherever you wanted to work um, out of any sort of number of WeWork locations within your city. Um, so they're generally sort of non-traditional workplaces whose location was discretionary. And I mean, this is a kind of revolutionary when it comes to um, urban transportation demand modeling, because you always kind of assume that the work location is fixed. Um, and so when you start thinking about, okay, well, if, if, you know, remote workers are waking up in the morning and thinking like, well, do I work from home or do I go to my favorite coffee shop for the morning to take a call? Or do I go to a WeWork because I need, you know, a little bit of social interaction during the day? Um, that really kind of opens up the entire landscape of where people can and do go um, and kind of requires a different type of thinking than, you know, what traditionally I think the transportation demand models have been based off of, which is assuming that people, you know, structure their entire work day around going to a specific place five days a week. Well, let's talk about another effect. So um, the donut effect, can you walk our audience through what it is and what it means for transportation systems? Yeah, this was a, an interesting uh, dynamic that kind of occurred um, also really in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic and, and, you know, extending out a couple of years afterwards. Um, and I think it was initially kind of observed by and then written up uh, about by Professor Nick Bloom at Stanford. Um, but it's the idea that it's actually more focused on residential locations. And so it was the idea that once people were able to do more remote work, they either decided to move closer into the city center or further away from the city center entirely. Um, and you can imagine kind of two competing motivations that explain why people would do one or the other. One is if you're, you know, potentially, um, you know, on the younger side, maybe you don't have a family yet and you're doing remote work all the time. Maybe you want to be closer into the city where you have a little bit easier access to all kinds of different amenities. Um, it's a little more exciting, maybe some more chances for, um, for, for socializing. Or on the other hand, maybe that you no longer have to go into a fixed office anymore, or you only have to go in one or two days a week. You actually want to move further away from the city so you can get access to more space for the same cost. Um, and so what we were seeing, and you can observe this in the data, um, and I wrote like a little blog post about how you can actually calculate this using some publicly available data. Um, but it was that the zip codes in the United States, there's a register of how many people are moving in and out of each zip code um, over the course of, I think, every month or maybe every year. And you could actually see that for a lot of large uh, metropolitan areas, there was this kind of donut around the city. So the center, kind of the whole of the donut, was seeing a lot more people moving towards it. And then kind of way outside of the donut, there were a lot of people moving into the rural areas as well. But this sort of like middle band around the city, um, there were that was where a lot of people were moving out of because it didn't really have the, you know, the urban amenities. So this would be kind of like your, you know, near suburbs, I guess. They didn't really have the urban amenities of like a city center, but it also, um, you know, you're probably a little bit price constrained on the amount of space that you can afford um, relative to a rural area. So you would actually see, and you can, if you plot like the number of people moving in and out of uh, urban areas, you can actually see this kind of donut around places like Chicago and greater Boston and Washington, DC. It's a bit of a polarizing effect. Like you either have the extreme urban or the like extreme rural effect, right? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I think this kind of goes to show that like when you're um, freed up of this constraint of having to go again to like an office every day of the week, it just gives you more options about where you can live as well, not just how you can travel, but where you can live. And so you really saw people start to exercise those options and actually move to somewhere that they preferred to live. Um, and that maybe it was really just the kind of pull of the office that was keeping them in these like near suburbs of uh, major metropolitan areas.